So I knew um, that he was, you say he was mocking his own movie, his own movie, the first movie. It was, there was a big joke about how the, the first one was. Oh yeah, well he's, uh, he's very, he, lo he does very good self-referential comedy. He puts a lot of, packs a lot of visual jokes in frames. And when I was in the howling, um, when I come in as the werewolf to kill uh, uh, Dee Wallace's friend, uh, there's, a, there's like a picture of Allen Ginsberg's poem Howl on the desk and a can of wolf chili in the background. <laughs> so there's like, he loves to do just, you know, visual jokes for people who are really looking at, you know, at, at the room. And, and, and he also does that with, you know, with line references. Uh, that's why he's a great guy. Uh, I worked for him probably a dozen times. The thing I remember most about the, the Gremlins, I remember three things about the Gremlins 2 uh, experience in particular. First of all, the female Gremlin, for those of you who haven't seen it, a very short, uh, thick-lipped uh, female Gremlin falls desperately in love with my character, who is the villain of the piece. Uh, Mr. Forrester is kind of the, the uh, hatchet man assistant to uh, uh, a, a Donald Trump wannabe called Daniel Clamp, played by John Glover. Um, any, in any case, uh, this female gremlin falls for me, and I had to be chased most of the movie by the female gremlin. And um, what that meant was when the gremlin jumped on me, in my, into my arms, I had to operate what's called a butt puppet. <laughs> now, a butt puppet takes its name because you're the, the active arm goes up the butt of the puppet. And uh, so what you do is they make a special suit jacket for you that has an artificial arm inside. Like there's a, inside the jacket they sew in an arm and a hand that looks just like mine. Meanwhile my real arm comes inside my shirt and out the front of my shirt and they put the puppet over my arm. The fake arm, which is coming out of the jacket, my hand, the, the fake hand is sewn to the back of the puppet's head. So when I move the puppet, the arm, my arm moves, my artificial arm moves in synchrony to the way the puppet is thrashing around. So I had to basically do all these things where I'm doing this to myself. <laughs> and I would come home with black and blue marks all over my chest for beating myself to death. <laughs> Not fun. At the end of the movie, uh, the female gremlin traps me in the men's room. And she's been chasing me the whole movie, so one of my pant legs is torn off. Because I thought it'd be funny if I had a, the old-fashioned men's garter holding his socks up. So I had a naked leg with big lip marks all over it. Big women's, you know, like where the gremlin supposedly kissed me. There was a assistant prop girl. She was the number three person in the prop department, a really pretty girl who had unusually pretty lips. Her job was to put lipstick on and kiss me up and down. <laughs> this is why I love show business. <laughs> I said to her, are you sure you're okay with this? Because they can make a stand. She said, no, it's all right. So it was great. <laughs> it was okay. She later married, had two or three children, was very happy, became a very successful prop director on one of the most famous television shows, Friends. And I ran into her party years later, and I said, do you remember having to kiss my leg up and down? She said, yep. <laughs> I said, I hope you didn't mind. She said, no, it was all right. <laughs> so apparently, she, she never held it against me. That was my second memory. Uh, the third memory was at the end of the movie when the female gremlin traps me in the men's room. The very last scene of the movie, the very end of the movie, is that you, they play Here Comes the Bride, and this gr little gremlin, this high with a little wedding outfit on, comes slowly marching toward me. And, I, and my reaction is the last frame of the movie. I think we shot it 17 times. <laughs> Everyone I did a different reaction. It's one more perverse than the next. <laughs> the most perverse one is the one that ended up in the movie. <laughs> I kind of look at the grandma like, well, why not? <laughs> She's here. She's available. What do I got to lose? And that's the last shot of the movie. And I can't believe that's the one he used. <laughs> but that's Joe Dante for you. Um, yes, uh, uh, next question. Do I alternate? Huh? No, I don't. I don't alternate. <laughs> Hi. Hi. My question is, um, how would you compare um, the feeling of the cast and crew um, of the end of the project compared to the end of Atlantis? Uh, of of the, um, the cast and crew of which show? Of Voyager with it? Comparing Voyager with Atlantis being at the end of both series. 
Okay. The only reason I asked you to repeat is I heard you said the cast of Enterprise was the cast of and I was going to have to throw you out. <laughs> well, if you mean how everybody felt when the show ended, I, I know that Star Trek ran seven years and expected seven years. We had a great run and it was sad when we, I remember the first crewman to leave, Ethan Phillips, uh, Neelix, left about two episodes before the end. And he, it was really a very emotional day because everybody could feel the end coming up the day that he said goodbye and decided to stay on that planet. Um, so it was, but at least we had the run up to it and we were prepared um, for it to end. Uh, what was surprising about Atlantis was I think that, and again, I was a latecomer to the show. I was a recurring guest star who took over the command the final season. Um, but it, it seemed to take both the producers uh, and um, the stars of the show by surprise that it was so precipitously ended. Um, you know, we, I think uh, the ratings were doing well, and there was the expectation that it would run another year. So I think that, uh, that and again, to me, I, I, I can't say I was upset or disappointed. I mean, I was disappointed, but I didn't feel like, um, what's the word? I, I, the whole thing had been a gift to me. You know, I had come in at the end. It was the easiest job I ever got. I was paid well to just listen to other people who had all the lines, just like when I was the doctor and I would report to Janeway and I would have a two-page speech and she'd say, after I spoke two pages, she'd say, what are you saying, doctor? <laughs> and I was gonna say, I think I just said it for two pages. But then everybody was reporting to me in Atlanta. Suddenly I was the boss and everybody would talk, 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 and I'd say, hmm. <laughs> and it's great, it's a great job. When everybody else is off doing the work and saving the world, and I just get reported to, that's the way to go, guys. <laughs> so it had been a wonderful experience now. I was treated beautifully, the other actors were great, you know. I, but when it ended suddenly, I think that the, the people that had been there for the whole ride were quite shocked and surprised. And, and I think to a certain extent, some of the loyal fans were upset and took it out on Universe that, that, that Atlantis had been um, canceled so precipitously, which was really not fair, because Universe was a terrific terrific show, I thought. I thought the cast was extraordinary. It just had a different tone. It didn't break the fourth wall the way um, Stargate SG-1 and the way um, Atlantis did. We weren't winking at the, at the audience. You know, that was part of Richard Dean Anderson's trademark style is, look, you know, we all know we're going to save the world in 43 minutes. Come on, just have fun. That was the tone of the first two shows. The, the, the universe, as you know, was very dramatic much more realistic and not, you know, and not self-referential, not kind of pointing at the camera. It was a different stylistic choice, but they did it extraordinarily well. Whether you miss the old Stargate, the kind of, you know, seat of the pants, action, adventure, humor of the original two shows, you have to admit Universe was exquisitely done, beautifully acted, really, really great cast, in my opinion, and I have a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yes, it was, it was sad when both, uh, obviously when both shows ended. It's, I love uh, working in series television. You develop a family feel. It's great to have a regular place to go to work. And it's also fun to have a character that you can live with and grow. Uh, I'm not speaking out of school when I say that most of the actors in Voyager felt that I had the best role. Because I started a blank slate and I got to change more than any of the other characters. So I don't think you'll get an argument from the other actors that I had the, sort of the juiciest part, as it turned out, in, in, in the show. And I completely lucked into that. I had no idea that the Doctor would be as interesting and fun to play with uh, as it was, because I didn't know Star Trek well enough when I became involved. Similarly, on Atlantis, I came in playing, you know, a one-time guest star, supposedly, who was a, just a dick. <laughs> Richard Wolsey was a dick. He was brought in to say, somebody fucked up. <laughs> we have in America. So I'm sure you don't use it here. Somebody fucked up. No, I, somebody messed up here who, and someone's head has to roll. So I came in to assign blame for the death of uh, Dr. Thank you. you. never remember. I remember Terrell Rothery perfectly. I can't remember uh, her character's name. But anyway, I, uh, so I was designed to be a one-time guest star. The producers of Paul Muley and and Joe Malazzi, I think, knew my work very well from Voyager. They liked me. And then when they had me up there, they kind of liked me. So they decided, okay, we've created this complete dick. 
<laughs> How did we have him back? So every time they had me back, I, I, I had a slight, a slight bit of improvement as a character, a slight little rehabilitating detail. Like the first time I'm back when I give um, evidence to uh, to President um, to William Devane's character about uh, how evil uh, uh, Senator Kinsey is, and I you know I do the right thing. We learn that Richard Woolsey is a dick, but he means well. <laughs> and then the next time I went, I was like I was a dick who at least knew he was a dick. <laughs> and they kept giving me these little character details or foibles that made me. You know, without violating what you'd seen before, they make me slightly more interesting, or slightly more bearable. Then they had all this fun with me being a coward, right? We did episodes where if, if there was danger, Richard Woolsey was running away faster than everyone else. <laughs> Not leadership material. So when they finally offered me the lead, I said, you, you're kidding. How can I? I mean, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a dick. I have no people skills, no leadership skills. I'm a coward. How am I going to lead the Atlantis expedition? They said, don't worry. We'll work it out. And they did. You know, they made me... Uh, you know, they, I was a completely rehabilitated dick. <laughs> uh, yeah, right? I, be, I mean, I became a leader of sorts at the end. It was fun. It was, you know, great. But I understand there were some fans who thought, I don't believe this guy's transformation. I tried, I did the best I could with the brief strokes I was given to make that believable to you. But remember, I was fighting a, a tough battle because I had been introduced as a quite, as quite a negative character. So. Um, for those of you who followed Richard Rossi's uh, transition into leadership position and bought it, I thank you, and I owe you money. <laughs> you all bought it, thank you. I appreciate it. That's what I like to hear. That's what I like. Yesterday I told, uh, 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 we had a panel, and I told a little story um, about um, when I was casting Voyager, uh, I originally auditioned for Neelix like an idiot. I turned down my audition for the doctor because Neelix was a bigger part, not realizing that had I gotten Neelix and I went down to the wire, I went down to the wire, it was me, Ethan Phillips, one other actor. Had I gotten Neelix, I would have spent something like 6,400 hours in the makeup chair. <laughs> All of which God gave me back because I got the doctor who was, you know, a couple of puffs of powder and that's it. <laughs> so, um, but when I, when I read the Voyager, I read the audition, it says, uh, a colorless, humorless, a computer program of a doctor. And I went, well, gee, that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> what do you mean a computer program? Is he a machine? Is he a robot? Is he, if he's a hologram, how do you hold a scalpel? <laughs> anyway, so after I didn't get Neelix, they called back and said, would you come in and read for the doctor? And at that point, I'd really fallen in love with the caretaker script, the pilot structure. And I think my wife had fallen in love with the idea of me having a steady job. <laughs> so she's encouraging me. And I said, I don't, I don't get the joke. I said to my wife, I don't get the joke. She said, read the lines. I read the lines. She said, I think you're funny. <laughs> she had her own agenda. <laughs> but I, I went in and I read, I'm the only actor, and forgive me for those of you who heard me say this yesterday, I'm the only actor in the cast who read one time for the party guy. Because usually, when you audition for a series regular, you go through many, many auditions. If you're not a well-known actor, you go just to the casting director first. If, you're, if you have a body of work, you skip that stage. You skip being vetted by the casting director, you go right to the producers. But either way, you audition for the producers, uh, sometimes twice. Then the producers plus the studio heads. Then the producers plus the studio heads plus the network. So you have at least three auditions. Sometimes I heard Garrett, I think, say he had five, something like that. I had one audition. They'd seen me already for Neelix, and of course I'm not counting that. So I went in and I read. Michael Pillar, God rest him, said, do you have any questions, Bob? I said, no, I'll just take a step back. I read. I ad-libbed a joke. I didn't know you didn't ad-lib in Star Trek. You don't ad-lib in Star Trek. But they all laughed. The casting director laughed so hard she almost dropped the pages. I knew I had to be funny, because they had seen, I was told, 900 actors. And, and remember, the audition scene was about six lines, seven lines. So I decided to ad lib an end. And at the end, the last scripted line in my audition was, I believe someone has failed to terminate my program. <laughs> and I took a long deadpan look at all the people in the room watching me, and I said, I'm a doctor, not a night light. <laughs>
I got a very big laugh and got hired the next day. But in the interim, I have discovered that, indeed, I am a nightlife. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to auction something for the benefit of a charity um, called Habitat for Humanity um, at my local chapter. Uh, this is... Um, this is a limited edition crystal of my head floating in the middle of the crystal. It's a holographic head of Robert. They used to sell these at Star Trek The Experience for about $250. Each one has a number, because it's a limited series, the number is etched in crystal inside under my head. And it sits on this beautiful little thing here. And we turn it on. And... No, it's, it's one way it just lights up and the other way it rotates. No, it's not rotating. <laughs> Alright, but anyway, it's all lit up. If the lights were out, it's the ideal night light. <laughs> Look at that. You know what? It's because I put batteries in. It comes with an AC adapter. Anyway, there you go. I'm going to auction this. Oh, can you go low, dimmer? It's pretty cool, because my face uh, lights up, and it's supposed to rotate, but I think it's because I have to... What? Oh, sorry. Well, if I hold it up, it'll slip off and break. What? I'll put it on the table? <laughs> okay. All right. Anyway, it is lit up. Why it's not rotating, I don't know. It could be that by plugging it into your current, the current hotel, I burn the motor out. But either way, <laughs> it lights up, and it's my, it's, it's a little head of me. And frankly, you know, you always, you need a little head in the bedroom. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? I can't believe I said that out loud. But what I meant... Anyway, so I would like to auction this for the... For, um, and the, all the proceeds will go to uh, Habitat for Humanity, my local chapter. Okay? So I'm going to do this very quickly. I'm sorry it doesn't rotate, but it is cool. Do you want me to hand just the, the head around? Just look and see my image floating in there. Remember, it's got fingerprints all over. But it's cool, right? It's my face floating in, in what? And I've got no back of my head. <laughs> Just like I sound right now. <laughs> okay, so anyway, as I said, they went for two, it has my autograph on the front. They used to go for $250. Am I, I'm gonna go up in $10 increments, but does someone bid $50 for a good cause for this? I have $50, do I hear $60? 100. I have 100, thank you. I'm happy already, 100 is good. Plus than half that we used to sell for, but we don't know if the motor works. But either way, <laughs> you can get another rotating base for fifteen dollars. Um, so I have a hundred dollars. Do I hear one hundred and ten? I have one hundred. Sure, was yes. Thank you. I like sure. I have one hundred and ten. Do I hear one twenty? I have one twenty. I'm a very happy guy, but I'd be happier with one thirty. Do I hear one thirty? I have one twenty. I'm sorry, I can't see a darn thing. One thirty. Thank you, sir. I have one thirty. I'm starting to sweat now. <laughs> All right, I have one thirty. Do I hear 140? 150. 150. I was saying 140. Aren't you listening? <laughs> I have 150. Thank you very much. Very gracious. I have $150 for the San Gabriel Valley chapter, which is my local chapter of Habitat for Humanity. I usually do a fundraiser in Vegas every year and raise four to five and a half thousand dollars for them. And for the first time in five years, six years, this would have been a six year, I didn't do it this year because I took my daughter to Italy. So I feel guilty. <laughs> so I feel good that I'm going to bring them 150, but I feel better with 160. Do I hear 160? Yes. I didn't thank you. I have 160. Do I hear 170? I have 160 from... Flap your arm. Who said 160? Way in the back. Thank you. I have 160. Do I hear 170? 200. God, you don't listen. Do you? <laughs> thank you. I have 200. Thank you, ma'am. I have 200. I'm very happy. I have $200. Do I hear 210? 210. It's a good crowd. I like you guys. <laughs> 210. Do I hear 220? Say something if somebody says 220 because I can't see. 220. 220. Thank you. 220. You two just want to go beat each other up outside. <laughs> I have 220. Do I hear 230? I have 220. I have 220. Do I hear 230? I will not be auctioning anything else. Unless you beg me. No. I have 220. Do I hear 230? I have 220. Do I once? 220. Going twice. I sold it for 220. Thank you, ma'am.
certificate of authenticity. It's number 77 in the series, I think. And I'm sorry that the case doesn't rotate, but it might. There's also an AC adapter right here that I hope works. If not, the main collectible is the crystal thing. Sorry about this. And here's the box for the. Where'd you go? Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for your patience. That's very nice, man. Thank you very much. Cool. Let's have a hand. My shoelaces died. What does that mean? <laughs> All right, cool. Slip ons. Good idea. <laughs> All right, so what should we do next? Should we do an audience participation number? Yes. What do we think? Oh, no, let's do another question. We'll, we'll save that for later. Yes. This is a It's been known that on this show, Kate Mulgrew and Tim Russ play horrible practical jokes to each other. And um, do you, what's the funniest practical joke you've ever played on set? Or if any? Um, I was not given, practical jokes usually involve a set, I, my style of humor was to make fun of the lines and to change the lines in rehearsal, try to make the crew laugh. Um, Tim, uh, you know, uh, the famous Tim story where Tubac had to appear naked on the bridge, you all know this story? I'll tell you my version very quickly. Uh, there was one episode where in a dream Tubac appears naked on the bridge, so when we go to shoot his dream, um, whenever an actor has to appear naked, they get body makeup on as necessary, whatever, and they wear a robe to the set. They rehearse with the robe on, and then they take the robe off, so he probably was supposed to have a little tiny briefs on or something. Instead, Tim had gone to the makeup department and borrowed a long black knee sock. <laughs> had stuffed the knee sock. So when, in the, when the cameras are all on us reacting, he took his robe off and he had enhanced himself. <laughs> Mr. Tubak was very impressive. <laughs> and every other cast member on camera burst into laughter, except for me. <laughs> because I'm such a good actor, I figured, I'm his doctor, I've already seen him. <laughs> uh, one of my, uh, when Jerry Ryan had been on the show for a while, and I was now comfortable joking with her, uh, we did an episode where, um, and we're rehearsing, and we've already had one or two rehearsals, and we're about to, we're doing the final rehearsal before we go to roll film. And um, I, I, it was a serious scene, and the doctor was in a sort of breathless way of speaking when he was, when he was hypothesizing something. And he said, the line was seven, your, your, um, your physiology is still something of a mystery to me. Right, that was the line. So in rehearsal I said, seven, your body is still something of a miracle to me. <laughs> And Jerry would just laugh. She didn't get mad. She never sued me for harassment. She would laugh. So that's what I would do. I would, I would do a lot of, you know, a lot of line tweaks that, that uh, would make the crew laugh. So that was my style. I'm not a... Practical joking takes uh, too much forethought. I'm an, I'm an instantaneous type. I don't mean that sexually. <laughs> just hold up, talk to my wife. I don't know. Um, yes. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the epically awesomeness of starring Voyager. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is a two-part question. Uh, after all seven seasons of Star Trek Voyager, the Doctor was trying to come up with the name for himself. In the final episode, that name was finally revealed. The first part is, did you have anything to do with coming up with the name? And were you happy with it in the end? Well, in the final episode, let's face it, they had to tie up a lot of plot threads, and a lot of it seemed rushed. Um, which was a little disappointing. I mean, for example, how Seven of Nine ended up with Jakote. <laughs> Come on. For three or four years, I'm nursing the... I mean, I'm teaching her, and I'm mentoring her. And he comes in at the last minute, steals her away, so what do they do? They give me some other leggy blonde. Like, I won't notice the difference? <laughs> so I was a little pissed off about that. But then, I think the joke was, after seven years of, of not being able to decide on an name, and and uh, then the name I decided on is Joe. I thought that the joke was that's about the most common for personal reasons. However, it is an odd way that uh, for a guy who had named himself uh, Mozart and Schmollis and um, uh, who else? I had so many names. Schweitzer. Yeah, I had all these names. 
um, and, and finally end up with Joe. You know, you know the whole reason we did the, uh, the, the name Dag was my fault. Um, we were shooting something like the fourth or fifth episode. We were shooting Eye of the Needle, I think, which was the fourth episode or fifth episode, which ended very dramatically with a pushing on the, on the doctor, uh, talking to Cass, and he says, I would like to have a name. The camera. <laughs> That's the end of the show. Okay. So, I, we, the, meanwhile, there's a screening, I think, for the Generations movie that we're all invited to. I see Rick Berman, and I say, when we premiere in a couple of weeks, are you going to list my character in the opening credits as Doc Zimmerman? And he said, of course, because that it was their plan all along, was that I would name, I would pick the name Zimmerman after my programmer, right? Lewis Zimmerman. I said, if we're going to do a plot line about whether or not I can have a name and what that name might be, and I can pick it myself, aren't we kind of Telling the surprise, <laughs> if we tell people from episode two that my name is Doc Zimmerman, how is the, they going to be suspenseful at, at the end of episode five when I say I'd like to have a name, right? And he said, you're right. So they took my credit out. My original credit had already been made, Doc Zimmerman and Robert Picardo, and they put in the doctor. And it never went away. <laughs> <laughs> had I not said anything that day, I would have been Doc Zimmerman by episode six, and that would have been it. So um, it was just kind of funny that they, they ended up enjoying that joke that a computer program, a piece of software, could be indecisive, could not only have a bad attitude and be snarky, but he, could, he, could not, he couldn't make up his mind. It's a funny idea, that because you think of you know, binary um, digital technology as a series of zeros and ones, and it's either this or it's that. You know, the, the fact that he couldn't decide whether it's zero or one <laughs> or any of, you know, it's, it's just a funny notion. So I ended up enjoying it, and it was one of those gags that just went on until the end. Yes? Um, welcome to Australia. Um, my question is in regards to the Space Nine Eight in episode um, about the year. How do you feel playing the two different characters, the Doctor and Lewis and Lee? Well, as I said, it's wonderful to work with myself <laughs> because I find myself very different. And I've already done these jokes, I can't do it again. Um, no, I, it, it's, when you do um, what's called motion control photography, when, whenever you see two, the actor play two different characters and they're not locked in a fixed camera position, you know, with a split screen like the old Patty Duke show and all that, where, where, you, where the actor played one performance and then they would play the other performance and they literally would cut the film in half and stick it together. When you see the camera moving, that's a technology that was developed in the... Uh, I guess in the early 90s, they called motion control photography, where you do the first take and the camera, uh, um, there's a, there's a, the camera moves on a track and then the camera on the dot, the camera head can pan or tilt or whatever happens, the computer memorizes everything the camera did in one take so that when the actor plays the other part, the camera moves exactly the same way. What that means is you're married from the, from the first take and the first performance you are married to every aspect of that picture. You know, if you have one character talking to another, and you have the one character, the, the establishing performance, the first time you do it, the character's on this side. When you do the second performance, if you are another two inches away, it doesn't look right, because it's not framed properly. It has to be perfect. If you walk around the other character, if you shoot, if, if, if I'm the first performance, and I'm talking here, and then as my second character, let's say I'm Lewis Zimmerman here, and the doctor comes over here, and then the doctor paces around and talks to me there, that means you do the first performance like this. Usually you do the more dynamic performance first, the one who walks first. So let, let me take that back. Let's say I did the doctor first. So I'm talking to Lewis Zimmerman, and Lewis Zimmerman turns his head. And then I come around here and talk to him this way. That means that I'm looking at nothing. I'm talking to nothing. I come around and I talk to nothing over here. When I do the second performance, if I'm not perfectly in the right spot, if I turn and my elbow infringes on my other performance, my elbow disappears, right, in the overlap. Any fraction of an inch off and you ruin the take. If I look here, but the other character 
you know, if, if I'm not making, how do you make eye contact when there are no eyes there? I discovered that the doctor had better posture than Lewis Zimmerman. So the, the doctor's eyes were up here and his eyes were here. Didn't think of that, because I stood upright in one character and I slouched in the other. It's so technical, I can't tell you. And you're constantly changing uniforms to go back and forth. It's exhausting. So to do one 17 second take, where everything is perfect, to do the other side, the other performance, can take literally 25, 30, 35 tries of high energy. And one little mistake in that 17 seconds means you, e you either have to cut there and go into close-up coverage, or you have to do it again. So it's very technical and, and exhausting. But when it works, it's quite wonderful. The effect is really neat. So I enjoyed it, but it's challenging and very exhausting. And I was very impressed with the finale of Voyager because Kate, when I know how tough it is, and when she did all that stuff talking to her older self, I thought it was seamless, and I thought she did a really wonderful job. Kate and I are very dear friends. I adore her. I know she was here recently, and she said some nice things about me. I say twice that about her. And the second question is, do you have to take any props back um, after you finish Voyager? Did I take any what? Props. After I, props. Props. Um, no, they're very touchy about that. Um, and the, the only thing I really got away with uh, was my final communicator. I walked off with that, but uh, all those expenses, you know, my little, uh, poly, you know, that, that uh, I don't know whose pockets they lined, but they disappeared. I mean, they went, probably, the, the prop guys locked those up, and then I don't know where they went. So no, I don't have any props to sell yet. <laughs> I'm making pictures of kids, so. no. <laughs> it's a joke, it's a joke. Um, there were some parallels between uh, your character, the Doctor, and uh, Data from Next Generation that, that you both had your eyes trying to overcome your programming. Did you look to Data and Brent Spiner for inspiration when you were portraying the character? Um, of course I did. In fact, my fear in playing the Doctor was that Data had been really the most popular character, or at least Data and Captain Picard are the two most popular characters by most people's estimation from Next Generation. And, and I thought, this is a no-win situation. Go in and play. And Data was this lovable Pinocchio-like child man who was so charming. And now suddenly I'm going to be a curmudgeonly, you know, arrogant blowhard <laughs> who's doing the same storylines, right? Who is the next generation, if you'll forgive me, of artificial intelligence? And I thought they mined this so successfully with this character that I thought I, it's a losing battle. So I was. Very, I was a little frightened to see how the audience would accept me versus him. But what, what's very clever about the way they think is that they give you something